Good evening, everyone. Can you folks hear me all online? You can just give me a nod. Thanks, Carmen. I appreciate that. I want to thank everybody for attending the In Conversation event tonight, Fostering Conversations with Law Enforcement. Here we have, sitting at the table tonight, I would say at least 75 years of experience in total between all you folks and how long you've been in law enforcement. <laughs> um, I would like to introduce to you Walworth County Under Sheriff Dave Gerber, City of Lake Geneva Lieutenant Ed Gritzner, City of Delvin Chief Jim Hansen, City of Alcorn Captain Alvin Brandle, and Mel Davis with the Triad of Walworth County. Our panelists will be sharing what's happening in our community, resources you may not be aware aware of, and that can be of assistance to you, and methods that would keep you and your family safe. As each person shares their insight, please engage and ask questions. We welcome questions that are geared to learning and building a resilient community. That's why we're all here tonight. You are members of the community, and there are leaders that can help. Please remember, not only are they our leaders in the community, but they are also community members, fathers, sons, daughters, mothers. They are people in uniform and in civilian clothing. They want a culturally safe community, and they would like you to be a part of that. This is where we all work together tonight. So let's start the conversation. Under Sheriff Gerber, you're up. Thank you, Santa, and, and thanks for inviting me to this. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, thanks for those of you that uh, showed up tonight here in person and those online. Um, Santa asked that we give a little overview of our departments uh, so you can understand um, some things maybe you didn't understand about uh, each of our agencies. Um, so I, I work at the Warwick County Sheriff's Office. Um, I'm the undersheriff. Um, some may ask what an under, undersheriff does. Um, basically, an undersheriff is appointed by the sheriff. Uh, so when a sheriff takes office, he appoints uh, someone as undersheriff. Um, sheriff Picknell appointed me two years ago as his undersheriff. Prior to that, I was a captain uh, in charge of the patrol division. Um, been at the sheriff's office for 25 years. Um, the Warwick County Sheriff's Office um, was established in 1839 um, before Wisconsin became a state. Our first sheriff was Sheriff Sheldon Walling uh, from Rural Lake Geneva. Was our first sheriff. Might have been one guy on a horse, but uh, we had a sheriff back then. And uh, fast forward. Um, 183 years uh, later, uh, Sheriff Kurt Picknell is our current sheriff, and he's been our sheriff uh, since 2015 and is our, is our 43rd sheriff. So there's been uh, quite a few sheriffs uh, throughout the history of the Walworth County Sheriff's Office. Um, the Sheriff's Department organization, uh, we have 213 employees within the Sheriff's Office. Um, the different areas in which uh, the employees are, are structured is the administration uh, part of the association, um, administrative support personnel, Support Services Division, Investigations Division, Communications Division, the Corrections Division, and then Patrol Division. The Patrol Division is, is basically the men and women you see out in the squad cars in uniform out in your, your communities patrolling. Uh, within the administration part of our of the Sheriff's Office, uh, you've got the Sheriff, the Under Sheriff, myself, um, our business office uh, personnel, our clerks, and uh, all those that kind of make the operation run for us uh, in the background. Uh, our support services division um, uh, encompasses our central records. So they're the ones when you walk into the sheriff's office, uh, they're the staff that you, you'd see at the front counter. They're the ones that process um, a lot of the open records requests, um, all the paperwork um, and the records within the, the sheriff's office. Um, we have the civil process uh, team. Uh, we have three deputies currently that are civil process specialists, and their job is to serve all the papers for the courts, all the evictions, the subpoenas, the writs, and those types of things. Um, that is one of the statutory requirements of the sheriff. The sheriff has a few statutory requirements he must perform. Uh, one is to tend to the courts, so that's civil process, as well as court security. So we have deputies assigned to the courthouse, and they provide security for the courts. <clears throat> um, and then the other statutory requirement would be corrections to maintain the county jail. 
Uh, within support services, additionally, um, there's the training unit. Uh, we have a vehicle fleet manager um, who manages all of our um, squad cars and all of our fleet. We've got about 60 vehicles in our fleet right now. Um, and we have an IT network engineer who works at the sheriff's department who keeps everything running from a technology standpoint. The investigations division uh, is our detective bureau. We've got nine full-time detectives that are generalists that work sexual assaults to thefts to homicides to whatever crimes need extra investigating above and beyond the patrol resources. And then also the Metro drug unit is run out of our sheriff's office um, with the cooperation of other agencies as well at times um, that works in the Metro um, drug unit. And their primary mission is to uh, enforce uh, a lot of our drug violations within the county. The next division is our communications division. That's the emergency 911 center. Uh, so when you call uh, the sheriff's office or you call 911, most of the calls will come into our uh, sheriff's office dispatch center 24-7, um, 365. And we dispatch for most fire and police in the county, except for um, the city of Whitewater, city of uh, Lake Geneva. They have their own dispatch centers. Uh, but again, we work very closely with them and, 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 and together. That's going to be kind of a common theme you're going to see amongst all of us is that's one one thing I really enjoy about working in Walworth County is the cooperation among all the law enforcement agencies. There, there are 16, law, actually 17 law enforcement agencies in the county, including the sheriff's office. And that's a lot of different agencies. And we all really get along well and we work together very well. You don't see that in other parts of the state um, as much as you do here. So that's one of the things I really enjoy about Walworth County is the cooperativeness amongst all the agencies. Um, Additionally, in the communications division is our countywide emergency management unit. Um, they've been extremely busy in the last two years with the COVID response. They're the ones coordinating a lot of the uh, PPE, uh, COVID testing, especially the COVID testing site here in Elkhorn with the uh, Wisconsin National Guard, working in cooperation with public health. Um, countywide emergency management are the ones that pre-plan any major incident that might happen in the county. Uh, for example, if a, a, you know the flooding we had a few years back, they help coordinate and bring in either state or federal resources to help uh, mitigate or provide assistance to, to the county. Um, the other division we have is a corrections division. That's our, our county jail. Um, in the jail itself, uh, we currently have approximately 210 inmates um, that are currently within the facility. And that ranges from those housed either in the jail itself or those out in electronic monitoring, the ankle bracelet program. Um, we. Because of COVID, we had to close our Huber facility. And the reason we did that was because we wanted to minimize the footprint of those that will go out in the community and work, come back in the jail and constantly be coming back and forth. We wanted to try and keep our inmate population and our employees uh, as healthy as possible so we can sustain the pandemic. Um, and then finally is the uh, patrol division. And within the patrol division are 53 deputy sheriffs, uh, three shifts a day, uh, 24-7, 365. Um, some of the components within the patrol division is the Traffic Safety Commission. Um, that's a state required commission that meets um, quarterly, talks about any um, issues that come up traffic safety related throughout the county and try to help mitigate those things. Uh, we've got three canine units. We've got one assigned to each shift. Crash investigation unit. So we didn't have any major crashes in the county. The crash <coughs> recon uh, unit comes out and investigates the crash. Um, and if there's any fatalities, uh, we, we treat that like a death scene uh, and process it uh, as such. We have a uh, contract with Whitewater Township. We provide uh, water patrol for them on Whitewater Lake in the summer. Uh, we've got a commercial, commercial motor vehicle unit. We have deputies that go uh, primarily goes out and enforces commercial motor vehicle laws, the big semis and trucks and rigs, so forth, making sure they're in compliance for the safety of all the motors on the, on the, in Walworth County. Uh, our town liaison program has been uh, uh, very successful for us. Uh, we have deputies assigned to each one of the townships that we have primary jurisdiction in, and they attend the monthly town board meetings, and they're a liaison between the sheriff's office and the towns, and it keeps us in tune as far as what's going on in the towns, any issues they might have, um, we can be right there and, and try to um, tackle that head-on. Uh, we have deputies assigned to the Fugitive Task Force. Uh, they're the ones that go out and work warrants, motorcycle patrol, uh, crime prevention unit, ATV and snowmobile patrol. So our ATV and snowmobile patrol is 
getting in gear here for the winter. If we finally get some snow, they'll be out. But I know they'll be out just in a few weeks here on Turtle Lake for the uh, radar run and those types of things. Uh, we have a, a mountain bike patrol unit, uh, Humane Deputy program. Our Humane Deputy is uh, works with uh, Lakeland Animal Shelter, and they investigate any crimes involving uh, animals, mostly dogs, cat bites, type, that type of stuff. But we do get a lot of complaints throughout the county of different uh, farm animals, for example, that people feel may be uh, uh, mistreated and, and not being cared for properly. The humane officers will go out and investigate those types of things. And then our sex offender registry, working in cooperation with probation and parole. Um, we go out and check on sex offenders and make sure they're in compliance with the DOC rules. And then uh, in cooperation with the rest of the law enforcement every year at trick or treat time, uh, we go and check on the sex offenders and make sure that they're not violating any of the conditions of their release. Uh, specialty teams at the Sheriff's Office, uh, SWAT team, uh, dive team, and our special events team. So SWAT, dive, and special events. Special events is our crowd control. And in the last couple of years, our crowd control team has been very active. We had some uh, planned protests that we responded to in both Delavan and the city of Lake Geneva, um, as well as uh, we assisted in Milwaukee and Racine and Kenosha with civil unrest in the last few years. Um, but the thing I want to mention on the SWAT team, the dive team, and the set team, all those teams are a cooperative effort between not only the sheriff's office, but most law enforcement agents, uh, agencies in the county. So there's members from most agencies in the county at each one of those teams, and it's a multi-jurisdictional effort. Uh, and then we've got an honor guard. Uh, that they go to a lot of the uh, funerals and ceremonies uh, presenting like the American flag and the colors for ceremonies. We do a lot of those at the Grand Geneva and other resorts throughout the county. So that's a real brief overview of the, of the sheriff's office. Um, and I, I meant brief because I could talk in, in depth in a lot of these different areas. Um, but I, I'm going to change gears here a little bit and get into some current challenges that we are facing at the sheriff's office. Um, we're, we're in a pandemic, obviously, and, and uh, that's that's been a, a challenge for us. Uh, we want to try to keep not only our inmate inmates healthy, we want to keep our employees healthy. Um, so we've compartmentalized a lot of areas within the sheriff's department, trying to minimize the amount of uh, footprints throughout the department. So for example, our communications division is on our second floor. We really restricted those that can go in and out of there. And there's a, a side entrance where our, our communications uh, officers can enter the building so they don't have to go through the whole building. So it kind of isolated because we want to keep those employees healthy, right? Because those are their 911 um, call takers. And if we start having a lot of uh, COVID infections within our communications division, we, we run into some some problems. So we want to keep keep them healthy. There is a backup built into our system. Delavan used to be our backup for communications, Lake Geneva is currently. So there's contingency plans in place, but we want to try to keep our employees as healthy as possible. Same thing with the jail. Um, you know, for quite some time, we had temperature checks and monitoring when our employees would come in and out of the facility. We stopped all, a lot of the programs. We stopped a lot of the footprints coming in and out of the corrections division just to try to keep that inmate population from getting sick. So that's that's been one of the challenges that we've had uh, in the last few years. Another challenge that we have with the sheriff's office is staffing. Uh, with the current climate, as far as the society's view on law enforcement and defunding the police, there's a, not as many people that want to get into the profession. When I applied 27 years ago, there were hundreds of applicants for a few positions. Um, recently, we've had um, less than 50 apply to our agency. And so we're, we're trying to keep our agency staffed uh, in communications, corrections, and in patrol. Uh, we currently have vacancies in all of them. So if anybody here is interested, we're taking applications for all, all those divisions. We're looking for good people. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have a background in criminal justice or police. We will train you. Uh, we're looking for good people, good citizens who want to be members of our agency. So is anybody out there, uh, please check the county website. We'd be more than happy to, to take a look at your applications. Um, so recruitment has been, a, has been a challenge for us. It's been a challenge um, countywide, statewide, and, and nationally. Um, and we're looking at ways to try to, to uh, help in our recruitment efforts. Also our retention and morale of our current staff. Uh, it's, it, it, it takes its toll on employees because we, we're considered primary workers. So we can't work from home. 
our, our deputy sheriffs are out in the community. They're responding to all your calls for service. Our correctional officers have to come into work. We have to maintain, uh, you know, and care for our inmates in our jail. And our communications officers have to come in and answer, you know, all, all the, the phone calls and all the things that they do up in our communications division. So we don't have the luxury of working from home and keeping our, our, our morale um, up within the pandemic um, is something we're working on as well. Um, I, I briefly mentioned the kind of the defund the police movement. And I just wanted to mention those online and, and those here in person. Um, Walworth County, for the most part, is very supportive of law enforcement. And I, I think that you wouldn't be here today if you weren't. And we really feel that. And we really appreciate that. So thank you um, for the support. And um, we don't have a lot of the issues that other cities and states are encountering uh, with civil unrest and so forth. I think we as a community, law enforcement, the community together, um, tend to have a really good relationship. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to work in a, an environment like that. And I'm, I'm happy that it's that way. So thank you for everybody for the cooperation because it's, it's an effort between all of us. We have to work together to keep our community safe. Um, some other challenges that we're, um, we're working on um, is our radio communication upgrade project. It's a multi-million dollar project. Um, and it's upgrading the communications between fire uh, police and EMS throughout the entire county. We've had studies done and we're working through the um, contract process now to, to pick a vendor to make that happen. And when I mean radio upgrade project, it's not just the sheriff's office and our portable radios. Um, we're talking uh, mobile units, but also base and vehicle uh, radios and that entire infrastructure not only for the sheriff's office, but for every police agency here, every fire agency and every EMS in the county. And it, it's really gonna bring us um, into the, into the um, um, current climate as far as the technology with uh, being able to communicate with each other effectively. So with that, uh, just some initiatives that, uh, that we're working on at the, at the sheriff's office and, and again, um, a lot of these initiatives you might hear as the rest of the panelists speak, um, but we we enacted uh, a program, I don't know, maybe <laughs> five, six years ago, and it was it's called P3 Tipsoft, and it's utilized um, quite a bit in the county. We average about three to 400 tips a year. Um, so if you, if you were to Google search P3 Tips or P3 Tipsoft, there's also a link to it on our, on our sheriff's website. Um, if you have any tips that you want to give us they're completely anonymous we don't know who they come from um, and there is a, a, war, a reward system built in that's anonymous I, I, i'm not exactly sure how that works but um, our crime prevention specialist deals with that but there's money that is put into an account that is anonymously put in there and you, you can get it if there's a reward um, from a tip that leads to a, leads to a successful arrest but uh, we solved quite a few crimes in the county um, and we uh, were made aware of a lot of crimes that are occurring in the county through that P3 tips off program. It seems to be pretty popular within the high schools. We're getting a lot of tips in our, from our high school students about crimes that otherwise may not have been reported or uh, we may not have had suspects at, uh, that are coming uh, forward through that. Uh, we started a program, uh, it's an autism and special needs registry. There's a link on our website and it's managed by the sheriff's office. The Autism and Special Needs Registry is designed to assist police and fire departments during encounters with members of the community who have disabilities um, such as Alzheimer's, autism, schizophrenia, dementia, and other mental or developmental disorders. And if you have a family member or someone that you want to uh, have become part of that program, there's a link on our website. and You fill out um, an information page on that person. It basically tells us who they are, who an emergency contact is, maybe some triggers that we don't want to engage in, or maybe some things we do want to talk about. It just helps us when we're dealing with, with those members of our community. Um, we also are, are proud to um, be the recipient of one of the newest embedded crisis workers through Health and Human Services. Um, I'm, a, I'm not going to steal Chief Hanson's thunder, um, but he has had an embedded crisis worker for some time. And uh, we've through cooperation with Health and Human Services, um, the program is being expanded. So uh, there is a currently a, a crisis, embedded crisis worker at the Whitewater Police Department, at the Delavan Police Department. And in the very new future, there'll be, there's gonna be one assigned to the city of Lake Geneva, as well as the Sheriff's Office. Um, and that's gonna 
really assist us in dealing with a lot of the mental health um, consumers out in the community that we, we as deputy sheriffs or we as police officers have to deal with now. It's just <coughs> someone who's specially trained to deal with people in crisis are going to be able to be a resource for them and, and be a great of assistance to us. Um, there's also an inmate locator tool that we're going to be um, launching live here shortly. It'll be a link on our website. And we get a lot of calls at the sheriff's office wondering if a friend of mine is in the jail or when's a friend of mine supposed to get out of jail. We, we fared a lot of those calls. Um, and the inmate locator tool is going to have all the information on our website. So you can click on it and you'll be able to see any of our inmates and, you know, uh, different things about it, times of incarceration and release and so forth. Um, the sheriff's office uh, just was reaccredited through Wileyag. It's a Wisconsin law enforcement accreditation group. Um, and uh, we uh, we just uh, received our reaccreditation last year. It's a three-year accreditation process. And so we're proud, we're very proud to be a member of, of the Wileyag accreditation group. <clears throat> um, just some strategies for safety, I think Santa wanted me to talk about. And I'm sure you're going to hear this as a common theme here, but um, with with COVID and um, the way things are going in, in, in the world today, we've been seeing an uptick in a lot of different areas of, of theft and uh, criminal activity um, in, in certain areas. And the, the best thing that I can I, I can tell you, I tell my kids, I tell my wife, is just strategies for safety, a situational awareness. So wherever you are, just be situationally aware of what's going on around you. Tonight when you leave here, for example, when you're walking out to your cars, don't just be so focused on walking to your car. Just take a minute to look around and, and, and see what's going on around you. Um, so you hopefully can, can ward off or you can pick up on something that just doesn't seem right before you get into that situation. Um, educate your family um, and your loved ones on how to respond to an emergency and have a plan. You know, we've heard for years how to respond to a fire in your house or how to respond to a fire in the schools. We do, um, you know, school fire drills. But educate your family and have a plan on if something were to happen. You know, the example I just gave you, if I'm walking out of the building here with my wife and kids and somebody comes up and wants to, you know, carjack, you know, steal my car and, and use a force, I'm going to try to draw as much attention to myself and my family needs to run away. You know, just have that plan in place before, you know, you, you run into something. So you kind of have a plan on how you're going to respond to those types of things. Um, one of the big things, and I, and I hear this, I've heard this for the last 25 years, um, is people sometimes are hesitant to call the police or call law enforcement. And what they, what, what, what they might think is trivial is exactly what you pay taxes for. That's what we're here for, right? So if you're having a problem with, I don't know, um, your neighbor, for example, uh, whose dog is always loose and you talk to your neighbor and you just can't come to any resolution, I've heard it a lot of times where I, I don't want to bother the police with this, but I've come to my wits end. Well, get us involved and call us because we can, you know, we can help you resolve those issues. That's who we're there for. Um, so don't be afraid to call the police. As, as truly as you might think it is, that's what we're here for, right? Um, some other strategies. A lot of times if, if, you can, if you see a crime that's being committed or occurring, sometimes the best thing to do is be a good witness. Uh, if you're not prepared or you're not um, in a situation where you think it's safe to get involved, sometimes just being a good witness. And, and the biggest thing that we ask is, is get a, a really good description if you can. Uh, if you can do it safely, grab photos or video on your cell phone. Um, but a lot of times we'll get traffic complaints of, of vehicles that are you know, driving recklessly or uh, someone who's impaired, for example. And if you can get a license plate number, that really helps us uh, track that person down or really helps us narrow down um, you know, who it was and, and, and try to follow up on those things. We've been seeing an uptick of uh, car break-ins in the county. Um, so I just caution everybody to please uh, lock your cars. Don't leave them running with the keys in them. and uh, Keep your valuables out of sight, especially if you're like at a shopping center or in a public place. Uh, make sure if you have any valuables, lock them in the trunk, keep them out of sight so that that's something that someone can see and become a temptation for them. Don't be an easy victim. And then scams. Um, be careful of scams. Um, there's lots of them going on right now. Our detectives are very busy uh, investigating a lot of scams that are going on, whether it be in person, whether it be via U.S. mail or email or internet or texting. Um, I don't know if everybody's been seeing, uh, I get a lot of text messages that look as though they're real. Like, hey, you just paid your AT&T bill, click here for a reward. Um, AT&T doesn't do that. 
and we've had a complaint where someone clicked on it and their phone was actually downloaded. So be very careful. Uh, I know there's emails that are that are sent that look like they're coming from, for example, Amazon, but it's not really Amazon. So just be really careful about what you're clicking on and, and what you're responding to. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to H and PD. I don't feel I have anything else to talk about. So that's, uh, I'm going to give it a try. So, um, just a short over. Is your mic on? My mic is on. Awesome. Am I good? Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ed Gritzer. I'm the administrative lieutenant with the City of Lake Geneva Police Department. Um, I'm going to discuss a lot of things under Sheriff Gerber uh, touched on already, with maybe a couple extras. A um, little bit about our police department. We're five years younger than the sheriff's department. We were founded in 1844. Uh, currently, we have 37 full-time staff. Um, within that staff, we have the chief of police that oversees the entire operations of the department, or I'm sorry, the entire administrative side of the department. Um, then there's me, the administrative lieutenant. Underneath my wing of responsibility is the communications center, which serves as the backup to the sheriff's office, uh, as well as the detective bureau. Um, our detective, our Comm Center, first of all, has one communication supervisor and seven dispatchers. We do have a couple part-time uh, dispatchers as well. Um, I also oversee the school resource officers. Uh, we have one and a half, basically one SRO assigned to the high school full-time, and then uh, one officer part-time assigned to K through eight in the city of Lake Geneva. Um, next would be the patrol lieutenant. Um, that's Lieutenant Bridget Way. She oversees the entire patrol staff. So any officer you see in a full uniform uh, in a black and white squad car driving around, that's that's uh, who she oversees. Uh, there's 17 full-time patrolmen, um, as well as uh, uh, Hispanic community outreach officers. So our population in the city of Lake Geneva, uh, the demographic, were 14% Hispanic. We felt it was very important to have an outreach officer uh, among that community that sometimes uh, is reluctant to reach out to the police. Um, for, for cultural reasons, uh, perhaps sometimes. So we've put that uh, that officer in place to hopefully bridge that gap and to make sure um, individuals that may have not uh, been comfortable calling law enforcement in the past, maybe will now. Um, so, excuse me if I sound a little weird, I'm a bit stuffy right now, but I am Rona free if anyone's concerned. I was tested. Um, also within our department, our special uh, operations teams that under Sheriff uh, Gerber uh, discussed, that's the dive team the special events team, which is like uh, crowd control um, and the SWAT team. Uh, in our department, we also have UAV operators, which are drone operators. That is something we've uh, gotten into pretty heavily over the last five, six years. We've got four um, drone operators uh, mainly used for uh, recovery or uh, searches for missing persons. We, uh, we've been very effective in using those drones to cut back location time to find a missing person or to locate somebody that's lost on the water. Um, they are very helpful in times like that. And like I said, could cover a large piece of uh, territory in a short amount of time, something that used to take us uh, uh, putting people in boats to go out on the lake or something of that nature. Now is very quick when we can put a drone up in the air. Um, currently, we have two full-time officer vacancies, as Under Sheriff uh, Gerber stated. Uh, recruitment has been very tough for us. Uh, we're too small to be big, too big to be small. We're a huge tourist town. We have about a 10,000 population of citizens. That booms to 40,000 in the summertime. We used to staff up to 20 part-timers per year. We're down to about three part-timers. Um, and that's just because we can't fill those positions. Anybody looking for a cop job basically finds one pretty easy right now um, because of the amount of full-time positions open. So that's one of our biggest challenges is recruitment and how to staff that summertime boom. We used to be a tourist town that was busy from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Um, now, due to things like Oktoberfest, Winterfest, and Airbnbs, um, our tourist season is extremely busy. Uh, we really noticed an uptick in it. Um, our friends to the south in Illinois, as their COVID restrictions were tighter and ours were looser, we everyone decided it's time to vacation in Lake Geneva year-round. So we have noticed a huge boom. Uh, we were 22,000 calls for service last year with 17 patrolmen, if you think of it that way, three detectives, um, as well as uh, the communication staff. So again, that's probably our biggest challenge right now is recruitment and how to handle a huge uprise in calls for service with the same staffing we've pretty much had before. 
correct me, we did add two full-time officers this year, but trying to get those filled right now. So it's going to take some time. You really took all my thunder. I want you to know that. <laughs> Good work. Um, we too are going to an embedded crisis worker. Um, hopefully by March 1st uh, has had, well, I don't want to steal any more thunder to my right now, but um, Chief Hanson will talk more about that. But uh, that crisis worker, we're hope as um, problems or issues increase, as things have become more stressful on society, whether it be from COVID or other issues, um, we're really hoping that embedded crisis worker and, and from all the testimony we've heard about it is extremely helpful. So uh, one of our biggest outreach, we are really big into um, community engagement through social media. Uh, we're one of few departments that have Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, um, and we allow people to engage us on that. We don't just send out information and don't let people send it back or allow comment. Um, we do do that. Uh, we found some of the simple crimes that used to be very hard to solve, and that's uh, somebody walking into a, to the quick trip and taking a 40 of alcohol or something of that nature. Nobody's ever seen this person before because they lived out of town or they were from another state. We share that information on our social media now, and we're, we're closing those cases out hand over fist compared to what we used to because of the demographic we could reach with those social media sites. Uh, to give you an idea of that, we've got 14,000 followers on our Facebook page and we're a population of roughly 10,000. So we're, we're definitely engaged uh, with the community. Uh, sometimes that comes with challenges though. Uh, anybody that's read a feed on a social media site can see how ugly it gets very fast. So that's a little bit of a challenge at, at times is to, to police that and to make sure we're allowing people their freedom of speech, but at the same time, not letting it get out of hand to create more issues. Um, That's about all I have for right now. Uh, some of the things we've uh, seen as well, uh, thefts from vehicles and theft of vehicles. I think our vehicle thefts went up 300% from last year uh, for us. And most of them, not all of them, were simply because a car door was left open and the keys were either in the car or they were able to uh, get in that car without creating a lot of attention um, and stealing it from that point. So. One of our biggest things is to make sure it's the simple stuff. It's leaving some exterior lights on at night. It's not leaving your car doors unlocked or leaving the keys in the car, which happens a lot more than you would expect. Um, we often hear when we respond to things like that as well, it's Lake Geneva. I didn't think that was going to happen. Well, a lot of the folks we're dealing with that are stealing these cars are just passing through Lake Geneva, looking to pick up another car, dump another one they've already stolen and take off. So, um, I think it's it's to train one another and to teach one another that it doesn't matter where you live. Um, we could get a lot of transient crime uh, when people are looking to dump cars and, and to keep that in mind when you're taking precautions at your own home. So uh, that's about all I have for right now until some questions. If I could turn it over to Chief Hanson and, and bail myself out so I don't ramble on too much more. Oh, you did my cough. Yeah. <laughs> Dave did steal a lot of thunder, but um, I'm glad that he he did that because it gave you an overview. And it also it, it kind of underscored how much we work together as departments. Uh, none of us have enough people. Uh, so when we talk about this, you know, we, you want to talk a little bit about uh, recruitment. Now, Delavan, we're lucky we have a full staff, but where we used to get 50, 60 applications for one or two positions, we're getting 12 or 13 now. And sometimes we're just scrapping the whole bunch and then starting over. Um, it, it's hard to get qualified people. And uh, one of our, our philosophy is, and just like the Sheriff's Department, Lake Geneva and Elkhorn, we'd rather go without than, than to hire a bad, bad person. So it, they were very judicious in how we, and who we hire because the responsibility that we have to serve you folks is at the very top. So we aren't, we aren't just taking people just to fill positions. And then you got to remember that once they get hired, uh, there's a, you know, between four and six months training period before we turn them loose. And it's a big investment because none of these guys know what they're doing for about the first two years. Nobody. It takes about two years before they really know what they're doing and they really got it. And then we hope to get real good work out of them until they're about their 12th year and then it starts to slow down. Because they're getting tired, but that's that's the reality that we deal with. 
Delavan, uh, we were established in 1897. Uh, we're about 9,000 people. We also serve the village of Darien, which is about 1,700 people. Uh, we have, uh, you know, 20, we have 24 um, full-time people. We just hired one additional patrolman. And in 2023, we're going to add another one. It'll bring us to 25. Um, our organizational structure is a chief, um, assistant chief, four lieutenants. Those lieutenants are two, two uh, patrol lieutenants, an administrative lieutenant, and a, de a, detective, a lieutenant that's with the detectives. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have two detectives that work. Um, we have one school resource officer, and we have currently uh, 15 patrol officers. What that does is put us at 62% uh, of our department is on patrol. 60% uh, is minimum. We're right in the middle, and 65 is optimal. So we're, when we get to that um, 20, 25 people in, in the 16, that'll be optimal for, uh, for a city. Um, our detectives, they're, you know, you can talk about um, the you know sheriff's department. They got nine detectives, but they're also handling um, cases from I think fourteen other jurisdictions. A lot of times, <laughs> in the city of Dullivan, we we take care of our own. But each one of our detectives and the lieutenant, they're juggling about fifteen cases a piece. So when you're talking fifteen cases a piece, you've got you know, the fraud cases, the scam cases, but we also have had a couple of homicides that we're still working on that we've got well over, you know, I think we're at last count, 1700 man hours wrapped up into that. We got abuse cases that take anywhere between eight to 12 man hours to take care of. So when we talk about scams in, in a little bit, and I'll talk a little bit about more how to protect yourself. We would rather prevent things than to go out and search. And those scams, the reason we want to prevent it is there is nothing we can do. It's really important to protect yourself. Once you hit that button or give away information, it is done. It is overseas. Even, even if we have information where it is overseas, they have no jurisdiction. FBI won't touch nothing unless it's $2 million. And I doubt that anybody in this room got $2 million to lose. So it's really, really important to protect yourself. We'll go over that in a few minutes. The, our vision with the, we all have mission statements, but our vision is to be respectful, kind, compassionate, and competent in the service that we deliver. And we want to be reasonable and consistent with that service because we're responsible to and for one another. Sir Robert Peel back in, I think it was 1812, put together uh, nine principles. The, the, one, uh, the one I like most is seven, and part of that is that we are the police and the public are the police. We're here all working together. We're the only ones that are getting paid for it, but it's each of our responsibility to work together. So it's really important that when we're, when we're doing that, that we're being respectful. The last thing I want to hear is that one of, one of the staff members aren't respectful, kind, or, or compassionate when dealing with people. That doesn't mean that we don't get direct once in a while, but we always start off in a nice way. Um, how we, uh, The city of Dullivan, we handle, last year was over 30,000 calls of service. Now, I don't want to paint a bad picture. A lot of that is community outreach that we document. So and part of that is we that um, I want every officer to do two traffic stops a day. We do a foot patrol in each the city and the town in the village, do a school check, do a business and do a business check where you stop in and talk to the business owner. At night I expect three business checks. Um, I want you to be up and down every street in the village and the city. And I want us to do the very best at every call of service, whether it's the neighbor's dog in your yard or something that happened that God knows that nobody wants to talk about in this room. Uh, it's, it's really important uh, that, that we do all those things because that's really what community policing, every one of those things that we, we have for expectations, it puts us, puts us in direct contact with the public. I want us to have good relationship with our community because we're all human beings. We're flawed. We're going to screw something up at some point. And we want to have that good relationship. So there's forgiveness and grace and that's got to go both ways. Um, things that we do in a community, we're kind of like everybody else. We do the Facebook posts. You, you know, if you guys get on Dullivan, you're going to see where you got, you know, people from out of town that, you know, are shoplifting and stealing things and, 
you know, we're hoping that we get tips. It does a lot of good. Um, you know, internally we did, uh, we do no shave November. Our guys, our people, we raise $800 and we were able to give to a, a local family that has a dog that's passing away from brain cancer. We had, uh, we did our shop with a cop. We were able to help, you know, working with our business owners, our school district, but we were able to service uh, 51 young people that wouldn't have had Christmas this year. Um, in July, we had our first soapbox derby, which I was very excited about. We had a lot of fun. And, uh, and we, we, when I say we, uh, the sheriff, uh, um, Oh God, Kurt Picknell and, 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 and Chief Rasmussen and I, we got together and we talked about developing a peer support group. Dullivan about five years ago, put together a peer support group internally. So if there's problems, you know, with the officers, we deal, you don't understand the things that, that, that the police officer deals with. It's not just the high stress things that, you know, all police officers do, but we're talking to people in their very worst. We're talking about kids that have been abused mentally, emotionally, and sexually. We have people that are abused sexually. We have, we, you know, in, in my career, I can tell you that I've, I've made 35 death notifications. And if you don't have, if you're not grounded and you don't have the right tools to work through those things, you're not going to make it through this healthy. And, and my goal is, you know, Every one of our officers, I want them to retire when they're 57 years old, and I want them to be healthy physically and mentally and emotionally. And that's one of the big uh, things that we've started this year. And uh, we're a month away from not only the officers, but the dispatchers, the support. You know, you f we forget about our dispatchers sometimes. They're the ones getting that call when everything is going to heck and and then we have the the people that do that do the transcriptions. They have to listen to those videos, and they have to tell type out exactly what our victims are saying. So they're, everybody's affected by these things that are going on. So, and this this group will also bring in our families, so they can help watch over us to make sure that we're all right. Because they're we go home and, and if again if you're not you don't have a good solid family and you're not talking these things through you can build up over time so we're real proud of that i mean every one of these the the chiefs we got together 17 chiefs we get, get said this is a great idea and we were able to work with aurora health and they're going to do that for us at no cost it's amazing and these two gentlemen the two doctors are doing it <laughs> I mean, they're just tops. They just, they fit right in with us. They understand who we are and how we tick, uh, what makes us tick. It's wonderful. Um, in the city, um, kind of like Elkhorn, I'm not going to steal any of your stuff. Go for it. No, uh, there's a lot. They, Walworth County is wonderful. You're as busy or as, or as lazy as you want to be here. There's things to do in, in Lake Geneva and Elkhorn's busy all the time with events, but you know, our downtown is crazy. Um, we have five or six events downtown. We have at the first uh, Saturday, we have uh, you meet the mayor, kind of like this. If you want to come and meet with them, it's great. We have a farmer's market on Thursdays. Um, in, in, in July 23rd is our 150th uh, where we were founded. So it's kind of cool. Um, main concerns, retail theft. Delavan, is, Delavan Lake, Lake Geneva were the two main retail outlets. Uh, hundreds of retail thefts a year <coughs> those hundreds of, and so each one of those takes about an hour to process by the time you get there you, you find out you id everybody you run everybody you write the ticket you get back and you do the paperwork it's about an hour so that's one man hour every time we have that we have hundreds of those um the fraud cases and scams if somebody calls you and tells you that that they're that they they have to pay taxes in france don't give them any money. If you get emails from somebody that you that, that they want you to send gift cards to, do not do that. Nobody wants you to pay with gift cards. Nobody wants you to pay with gift cards. I don't know how many times I say it. We have thousands of dollars that people are, are uh, scammed out of in Dullivan every year. We have people. We have uh, we have people that. Um, we just work in a case where they've given $175,000 away to somebody they thought they knew that had to pay taxes to somebody in France. Don't do those things. If it, you got to listen to that little, little voice in your head. If it's telling you not to do it, don't do it. 
check with somebody, talk with somebody, talk with, you know, an attorney, talk with the police, talk, but don't give out your personal information. No, Social Security, nobody is going to contact you <coughs> via phone. If you're in trouble with the IRS, they'll be on your doorstep, okay? Don't don't think that that's going to happen. Don't don't be paying anybody because they've made a phone call to you. It's so important. That's what happens. And they, they get caught. And then once they once they know they got you, they pass your information on to somebody else and you get another call. Don't do it. Um, and then the other thing that we deal with, and I think everybody here, because I listen to the radio, is family trouble calls. <clears throat> get, you know. And I don't think anybody in this room, but the people you know, if you're upset, go for a walk. Nothing is as bad as what you think it is. I, I, we all understand that relationships begin and sometimes they end, but it doesn't have to end with violence. You've been, you know, one of the things that Stephen Covey, if you ever read any of the books, he goes, disagree agreeably. If you're not going to come to a resolution, go for a walk. Please go for a walk. We don't want to go to those, you know, if, in, like I said, if a relationship ends, end it amicably. You know, be, you know, you, we have to be respectful to one another. And sometimes when at the heat of the moment, people don't do that. And that's what we need you to do. Just go for a walk. If it's not working out, go for another walk. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Dullivan. Uh, we had transitioned our uh, dispatch over to uh, the county, and I got to tell you, I really miss the the um, the convenience of having it. Uh, but the interoperability with the the county and the city is immeasurable. We know what's going on in the county and the county knows what's going on in the city. And before you complain, I know everybody, <laughs> Dull it's a Dullivan channel now. I know we're busy. I get it. But I got to tell you, uh, the year the, the year before, we had a, a stabbing that took place over at Family Dollar. And we got over our radio, went over 800. Our officers got on South 2nd Street and they had the, the person... Um, where we thought they were at, but then we had the county people come in in their private vehicles, the <laughs> ERT team, and we didn't know who that was, and they that proposed a a concern that they could have been a blue on blue shooting, and we did not like that. Now, when we call for for help, we have our radios. We hear exactly what's going on, who's coming along. Amazing. The one more thing about interoperability. Darian, we had a murder suicide a year and a half ago. Um, we called out the sheriff's department. Unbelievable! They come there. We can handle. We we have the expertise to work it. We just don't have the people. We don't have all the equipment that we need. When they come, they bring their they bring their equipment. They bring their people. They bring their knowledge, their experience. And we just have a better product at the end of the day. We're so thankful to have that partnership. On top of that, we had Lake Geneva there with their drone. Wonderful. We got we just bought a drone this year. We're going to be part of that team now. Our communities work so well together, and and we are blessed. And you should feel thankful that we do that. <laughs> we don't get as get as much chance to work over here in Elkhorn as much, but listen, if Elkhorn were to call or we were to call, we know that Elkhorn's going to be there. We and they and they know that we're going to be there. We have such a great relationship. And I gotta tell you, and we talked about the support from the community. Walworth County is wonderful. Listen, when we had when we we had our Black Lives Matter protest. Everybody was there. We had the set team, we had the county there, everybody. You know what the nicest thing was is when we got up there, one of the people got up there and said, you know, this and this about the police, but we like our police department. That touched my heart. You know why? Because you know what? I understand that there's issues going on nationwide, but Walworth County in the state of Wisconsin, the policing in this state is above, above it, we're the ones that set the bar. You know, they came out with the, you know, was it uh, eight, something about um, eight things that they didn't want um, going on anymore nationwide. Wisconsin's been doing this since 1991 when I started. We were already ahead of the curve. 
you guys have great law enforcement in this county. We work well together, and I'm thankful for that. And now I'm going to turn it over to you. You got anything else? I don't. Okay. No. <laughs> Good. No, I don't have much else to touch up on, but um, just to follow up on, on Jim's point there, point there um, yeah, I'm really grateful to work with these guys here at the table with me. Um, and all the other villages and, and townships that are around us, we have great relationships with all of them. And that's, I think, how we make it work in this county. I think we're very lucky. I think you could put our county up against any county in the state. And I, our law enforcement wise, and I, I'd put you, we've got to be right at the top. So I appreciate all these guys on the table here with me. Um, so Elkhorn PD, I'll, I'll give you a brief summary here. Um, currently uh, 16 officers. Uh, we were fortunate this year that uh, we were able to get one more, that, our approval to add one. Um, we have not done that yet because we're doing some restructuring in the in the department. So um, typically we have nine patrol, two sergeants, two detectives, a school liaison liaison officer, uh, myself in the captain spot, and then the chief. Uh, but we're going to go to three sergeants now, and now we're getting to add an officer uh, to help with. Um, basically, we've had a lot of turnover the last five years. Um, they, all from retirement. We don't have officers leave or fired for any reason, but it's all been retirements. Um, so at the 16 that we have, a third of them are with less than five years experience, which is, um, it's a growing pain for us because uh, we want these guys to be proficient and professional and it takes, it takes that experience and until they get that three, four, five years on, uh, they're not there yet. So uh, we felt that adding a sergeant uh, to supervise it would, would help us with that, especially on the night shift with our younger guys. So uh, you'll see a, a change there uh, in our department. Um, another big change that we're kind of excited about um, is we just got our new squad car in. Uh, you're going to see that it's not the same ugly black and white one that you see driving through town. Um, we're going to go more traditional. It'll be black and white, but it'll have gold and uh, purple lettering. So more inclusive with the community and our school colors uh, is what we decided to go with. We think it, the community will really like it once they see it. So we're excited to, to display that here shortly. Um, let's see what else we got here. You guys took a lot of my uh, subjects here. Uh, so go back on the department. So we do have a CSO um, during the days. You'll see him. He's the one who does our parking. Uh, he will be doing going full time and taking on some additional roles uh, at the department to kind of help us fill in the gap. Because in 16 officers, we are uh, stretched thin uh, for the city of 10,000. Um, we've been at 16 since the early 90s. Um, and the city obviously back then was probably 3,500 people. And now we're at over 10,000. So. Uh, our call volume has, has greatly increased over the last year. It's gone up about 35% from 12,000 to 16,000 calls. Um, so we're working hard to try and provide the same services we always have uh, to the city. So, uh, and then we also have one confidential secretary, Teresa. She's kind of the glue that keeps our department running. Um, she handles all the paperwork. She gets all the reports and files out. If you have a, if you request a report, she's the one who puts that together for you and gets it to you. Um, so. Uh, we're pretty fortunate to have her and have her uh, kind of keep us keep us running and on track. Um, so a few of the things that we do uh, and offer some programs. Um, one of the big ones that we're pushing now is the community camera program, uh, which is uh, an opportunity for the community to register their cameras, their security cameras with us so we know who has them. Um, because kind of like Jim was saying that it, the, it's a partnership with us in the community on solving crimes. <laughs> So if we know who has a camera and if there's a crime in that area, we can go to that person directly and, hey, can we take a look at this, at this footage and see if it can help us solve who, who committed this crime, whether it be a theft or something more serious. Um, so that's that's a program we're pushing. Uh, it's a simple form to fill out on the city's website uh, and submit to us. And if people are interested in that, we'd appreciate that. Um, some other programs that were that are newer to us, um, we started the uh, lethality assessment program with New Beginnings, and that is a program, uh, if we are called to a family trouble or a domestic abuse incident, um, it helps us, we, it's a brief questionnaire that we, we do with the victim, and uh, it gives us the opportunity to put that victim in contact with a counselor uh, from New Beginnings that evening, if it's in a serious situation, or at least give them that information to reach out and hopefully help them uh, gain some resources and get out of that dangerous relationship. Um, some other programs that we do that we like to talk about are, is our Handle with Care program with the school. Uh, so anytime we go and we deal with a juvenile issue or maybe even a family trouble and the juvenile was there to witness it, um, we send that juvenile's name uh, to the school district. We don't give them any details on what happened uh, or may have happened. So it could be something more serious. Maybe it's 
they're having some suicidal ideations and things as well. Um, so we'll send that to the school and the school kind of works. I'm not really sure how to describe it. They work around the student. They give them kind of some extra guidance, some extra space, maybe if they need it, because they know they're going through a stressful time and uh, uh, to help them with that. Uh, so that's a program that I think everybody on here is, is a part of as well in their own in their own cities um, that we like to do. So uh, in the summers, we have uh, the, our public school, or I'm sorry, our police school liaison officer does Safety Town uh, with the incoming kindergarten class, teaching them basic safety skills. Uh, we really like that. We have guys uh, on first shift, they stop down there all the time just to hang out with the kids because it's fun. Uh, gives our guys kind of a break and, and get to, to meet the the next generation, I guess, of uh, of people in Elkhorn. So it's it's a great great opportunity for them. Um, we did just start a Hispanic outreach program ourselves. Um, so every year when we hire an officer, they go through what's called the police training program. And at the end of the program, uh, they do what's called a, a NPE, so a neighborhood uh, portfolio experience. Um, so they have to find a problem or a project to implement in our city and our police department. Um, so one of our, our guys, uh, he is bilingual and he, we talked to him and he was willing to do this uh, Hispanic outreach. So we started there at St. Pat's church. Um, he's been there at least once, uh, and had kind of had a meeting with, uh, the congregation there. And, uh, it seems to be promising because like I said, that for some reason we want to break those barriers down. So they feel people feel comfortable to come to us, um, regardless of their culture. So, uh, that's another program that we've recently started. Um, and then to jump on with some of the officer wellness uh, initiatives that a lot of agencies are putting on, we have a peer support program. We have two officers involved in that. Um, and everything that happens there is confidential be confidential between that officer and, and the peer support officer. So if they come to them with, with family issues or work issues, uh, it just gives them a place to vent and kind of express themselves without any uh, fear of retaliation or backlash. Uh, so it's a great program, uh, so I've heard. They, uh, the peer support officers can't tell me anything about it, but they, they give me good feedback saying that people are coming to them, which is good, which is what we want. We want people to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And along after the officer wellness lines, we do have a great uh, relationship with the school district. Uh, they've given us, our officers, access to the, the new facilities there, the workout room and stuff. So uh, we have a place that we can be at least physically work out and keep healthy. Uh, obviously, we need to be in, in good shape for this job. So. Uh, we're appreciative of that. Uh, a couple other things. Let's see. Oh, along that community, community camera program, I'm sorry I'm jumping all over the place here. Uh, my chicken scratch is less than legible sometimes. Um, but uh, so with that, we are also on several social media sites. We got Facebook, uh, but we also do the Ring Neighbors app. Um, so if, if uh, you have Ring or, or even if you don't, the Neighbors app allows you to share video with us if your video catches something suspicious in the front yard or if someone's cutting through your yard or maybe they're looking in your car window but they don't get in your car because it's locked hopefully uh, you can share that video with that neighbor's app with us uh, which which would be very helpful because uh, we do have quite a few car break-ins unfortunately especially in the summer so um and then just to touch briefly on some of the uh the work we do with the county um so we do have members on the set team and the SWAT team. And I think that, again, just goes to show how well we work together and how much we depend on each other to do our jobs and, and provide the services that we do to the communities out there. So uh, that's all I've really got. These guys really touched on a lot. Can you follow up? Of course. This is really dialogue, folks. So type in I know, but you look like you could get ornery if I jump out of turn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All Your right. Boys will do that. <laughs> I do not agree. <laughs> the um, the camera. We we all work on Pro Phoenix uh, for our record keeping system and <laughs> our dispatching system. Under citizen services, if you have a ring doorbell or or similar um, outfit, you can register that through citizen services um, with you know Elkhorn PD or Dalton PD or Lake Geneva. And if we get a 911 call in there, it'll automatically pop up. So if we if there's vehicles we're looking for, we can capture that information right away. Now I'm not techie. So when you call one of the places, you're, you'll end up probably talking to uh, Assistant Chief Bilski and walk you through that. I just know that it works and it's really cool. Um, but it, it's a great tool for us. And then I wanted just to jump back because I was giving everybody a hard time about our crisis worker. It's an amazing program. Uh, 
uh, Ms. Uh, Dave over there talked a little briefly about it, but we have Denise Millette who's just getting promoted. And so we're going to get a new one, but these people come in and they, they're in our offices. They're, they're working with our, with our staff, but they come in, um, we go there and we'll settle the, the scene down, make sure it's safe. And we can turn that person over to them if, if it's, appropriate and it gets our officers back out so they can get back to you know handling other calls or stuff this is, is probably one of the the, the biggest uh, advancements that we've seen in our county in a long time i mean walworth county has been great pro phoenix is unbelievable with the interoperability their communication center everything but having the having this with, uh, with human services and having that that partnership is just amazing and and Hopefully, and, and it's not just Dullivan, you know, Denise takes care of Dullivan, Dullivan Township, Darianne, and if they need Sharon, they go there. It's the same thing with the Sheriff's Department, Lake Geneva, up in uh, Whitewater. If somebody in those areas need it, they'll leave that area because they are a Walworth County employee. But I just want to touch on that. It's a super, super um, program. I'm so glad that we're all getting involved with it. Now, yeah, and Chief, if, I, if you don't mind if I say a few things on that, and I echo... 100% what, what he just said. And I don't know if a lot of people in the community realize how many calls for service that we all go on annually that deal with mental health, whether it's suicidal subjects, people in crisis, um, people just need someone to talk to. Um, we, we as law enforcement are the ones who traditionally respond to those types of calls. Someone's suicidal. Um, and we've seen in, in my career, um, I guess I haven't really looked at any kind of charting, but I can tell you from experience without having the statistics available to me that I've, I've seen in my career an uptick in suicidal calls in the last five or 10 years. And traditionally law enforcement, we, we received training in how to deal with people in crisis. Um, we've put all our staff through what's called crisis intervention training. Um, most of the officers in the county have, have, have been through some form of that, um, but it's nice to have other resources available to us that have training in excess of what we have to deal with people in crisis. And when you have a, an officer that responds to a suicidal person, for example, and we as law enforcement get there, that's a dangerous call, right? Because we don't know what we're going into. We don't know what type of weapons they have. We don't know how aggressive they're going to be with us when we get there. And when we can stabilize <laughs> the situation and we deem that the person is a harm to themselves or others, if, if they don't get further treatment, we can work with Health and Human Services and request what's called an emergency detention. It's a mental health hold for up to 72 hours to get them help. But that process can take 8, 12, 16 hours as our officers have to deal with what's going on at the scene. And that can take an hour or two. We have to transport the individual either in our, in our squad cars or sometimes via ambulance to a medical facility, whether it's Mercy or Aurora Lakeland Hospital. And they have to do a, a mental evaluation as well as a medical evaluation, and then trying to find placement for that individual. And that, that's a piece that can take three, four or five hours to try to find a mental health facility that can take this patient based on their medical situation and their mental situation. And then we have to transport them to that facility. And sometimes we're transporting them to Green Bay. Sometimes we're transporting them to Oshkosh, to Winnebago Mental Health. So you figure the time it takes for our officers to drive up there, transfer that person over, and then come back. And you know, we talked about hundreds and hundreds of hours in, in, in uh, retail theft calls, and that's commensurate <laughs> with mental health as well. Mental health is, a, is an issue that society um, has to deal with. Uh, it's a problem. I think it's a, it's an increasing problem, and I'm really happy that uh, we have a partnership, not only with law enforcement, with but with Health and Human Services, to get these crisis workers in embedded into our police departments and sheriff's departments, so they can help us deal with the people that we're dealing with out in the community. I'm Mel. I'm Mel Davis. I am not a law enforcement officer. 
I don't have a big department, but I really am honored to be here. So thank you for allowing me to be here with you guys. Um, I am the triad of Walworth County chairperson. So that is the triad. If you don't know what that is, it's a group made up of law enforcement, first responders, um, senior service agency professionals, and most of all seniors. And what our goal is to do is to um, offer, offer education to our seniors so that they don't become victims of crime. Um, the triad has been around since 2019 in Walworth County, but triads are a national program. They were started in the late 1990s, started in Louisiana. A couple sheriffs in the parishes got together and thought people, um, seniors needed some education because they were becoming victims of crime. So I, um, my background and why I got involved is I've worked in, as a social worker for about the last 29 years. And I did a lot of my time in adult protective services. So I was on the other end. So I would see people after they were, uh, they were already in a scam or they were victims already um, thinking, what can we do on the front end to prevent that? So um, the triad has been an interesting, it's been interesting because it started and then we went into a pandemic. We um, are able to provide education. We work with different law enforcement officers to help provide education in different groups. Um, but since the pandemic, we're dealing mostly with seniors and that's the most vulnerable population. So events are not happening. We can do things virtually. Um, but what we have been doing, our biggest initiative is our Easy ID program. Um, that is a self-contained unit where we can take a person's demographic information, we can take their emergency contact information, uh, digital fingerprints, photographs and audio recordings and put that on a jump drive for family members for free for people that are at risk of wandering. So we can do that for people that might have a cognitive impairment or dementia or um, we can do it even for kids or people that are just at risk. We offer that for free. We can go to someone's home to do that, or we can do that at events. Um, another initiative we have is a file of life, which is similar. That is um, a paper um, program that um, has all that information on it too, that can be put on a person's refrigerator. So if law enforcement goes into the home, then they can look on the refrigerator, see that and know that, that, that who the emergency contacts are, who, what the diagnoses are and all that. Um, the biggest thing that I've seen with being part of the triad is, as the guys up here have said, scams, financial exploitation has just skyrocketed over the years. I think we're like in our 12th year of 10,000 people a day turning 65. The baby boomers are all aging out. Um, the, if you look at the demographics or the state of Wisconsin, I mean, we're just flipping to a much older um, population. So you have people that are living longer, you have people that are staying in their homes longer, and those folks generally are, the older populations are the more trusting. They don't have the technology knowledge. Um, they're going to be the ones that are going to be picking up the phone when their calls coming from who knows where. Um, so those are the people that we're trying to outreach to. Um, a lot, these guys had a lot of great tips for crime prevention. Some other things um, that I think are really important. Uh, if you have family members or friends or people that are getting older that you have concerns about, there are things that you can do to try to assist them. Um, if you think someone has become a victim of a crime, you can report that to the Adult Protective Services Unit at Walworth County Department of Health and Human Services. You can also reach out to your loved one's bank and let them know that you have concerns that they might be a victim of a financial exploitation. You can also reach out, if even if you are the victim of financial exploitation, you can freeze your credit through the um, different credit agencies or bureaus. You can do that at any time. That way nobody else can take out another line of credit on your name um, during identity theft. Um, another thing is social media. So 
social media is like, there's the good and the bad. You hear these guys talking about how great it is and it is a great tool. It also is, um, can be a tool that can be very dangerous, especially for older folks um, who are getting on social media. Even folks, in my experience working over the years, I've, I've worked with family members. I've worked with people who have been retired law enforcement, who have been victims of crime. These people had all the knowledge in their head to know what a crime was. Um, however, as you age and you might have some cognitive impairment or slivers of dementia, your brain might not be um, working at that high functioning level that it once was. And so you are susceptible to crime. Keep an eye on your family members' social media. As an example, I have a mother-in-law who will just about accept every friend request that comes in. And so you see like the person in the hut in Africa and you ask her like, okay, Vaughn, why are you friends with that person? There's clearly no electricity. Do not friend that person. And so you just be vigilant and um, be aware. I know um, with that older generation, they don't wanna talk about money. They don't, they might be embarrassed, but Try to help and assist them any way you can. That's the best thing that you can do. Um, hopefully once we're out of this pandemic, which is crazy, uh, we'll be able to get back out and get into the communities because that's what the triad is all about, is really reaching out to the seniors and having seniors be part of it. Um, so we're looking forward to that. I do have a question. Is the triad only in Wisconsin or is it nationally wide? Thank you for asking that question. It is, this is a national program. So there are triads in every state. The state of Wisconsin, I don't, I don't know the actual number of how many triads we have. There is a state triad in um, Dane County. I'm part of the board for the state triad also. Um, and then I think there's probably maybe 30 spread out across the state. Um, we are part of the Tri-County Triad too, which is Racine and Kenosha and Walworth County um, working together. But again, since COVID, we really haven't been getting together. It's just kind of changed the whole um, layout of the triad, but yes. All right. Can I have a oh, of course, Eric. Uh, just out of curiosity, how do you become the sheriff or the chief of police? Is that an appointment or is that an election or you just been around the world? <laughs> yeah. So the, the question was, how do you become a, a sheriff or a, a chief of police? Um, so. We have one sheriff, and that's Sheriff Picknell, and it's a four-year term. He's elected sheriff um, three years ago. This is this was final year of his of his current term, um, and then traditionally sheriffs had to have some sort of law enforcement experience, um, but it's not always necessary. Anybody can. can it's an elected position by the electors. Yes, um, my position is under sheriff, as as I'm second in command of the department. Work closely with the sheriff, um, and I'm an appointed person by the sheriff into my position. Um, everything else below us is either deputies, sergeants, correctional officers, communications officers, records clerks, um, lieutenants, captains, and so forth uh, within the department. So our sheriff is elected, and I can let you know Chief Hanson talk about how he became a chief. Um, with the with the cities, it's they have a police and fire commission. They usually do a, a either a nationwide or a statewide search. Uh, there's, you know, you apply for the job. Uh, you go through uh, a few different uh, interviews, some testing sometimes, <laughs> and then they make a decision in who they're going to pick. So that's so, you, you, so that's not an elected position. Nope. No, and I've been with you know for me I. It was with Dullivan. I started out as a part-time officer. I was a dispatcher, patrolman, school resource, detective, captain, assistant chief, chief. I kind of worked through the through the process. But you know, with you know, with the under sheriff and, and most of us here, 
you got to you, you have to invest in your education um, with Dullivan to hit at least a bachelor's degree in order to even apply. Um, a lot of places are asking for master's degrees now. So there, there's there's some requirements that need to be the met before you. But Dullivan certainly got a delightful chief, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I just wanted to give a shout out too because Bernadette and myself here at the Dementia Friendly Community Initiative. And we're really happy to say that we've gotten <clears throat> close to 90% of all the police departments educated on how to work with folks with Alzheimer's. And that's a big boost, I think, uh, to move this up with the crisis situation, but we're also really out of the community to get them educated on so they don't call you for things that shouldn't be called, but you should, shouldn't be called this. So last year we should train almost 1,000 people, most of them virtual. Thanks for everything you do. I think you trained our department maybe three years ago now, and it's uh, for the 22 year old brand new cop. Yeah. It's probably the least experienced dealing with, uh, you know, folks uh, that are in the years, and that helped out greatly. So thank you. Is there any other questions in the audience? Oh, hey, folks are bashful on me. Um, I have some questions, but before I do, all you folks have shared some great information and besides Chief Hansen, you've been pretty quiet. <laughs> um, is there any dialogue that you guys wanted to share from what other somebody else has said regarding initiatives and ways to protect yourself? Yes. Uh, one that we missed, I think, and it's I know takes most of our school resource officers time is the technology with our teenagers. Um, I think they pretty much our SROs spend a lot of their day chasing down uh, things that may be inappropriate that are sent cell phone to cell phone or whatever it might be. Um, that stuff is extremely time consuming. A lot of it could probably be handled within the home just with some basic rules, maybe basic communication. Um, or just keeping some checks and balances in place, knowing what social media sites your uh, kids are on and checking in every once in a while and keeping an open line of communication with your children. Uh, a lot of times, uh, little things that seem pretty innocent end up being used for other things that are not so innocent and our kids need to be aware of that. Um, and the resources uh, to learn about that or if you need more information are definitely the the school counselors and the SROs, the school resource officers in the schools. So, and I'll touch on uh, with parents and phones. When you decide to give your your child a phone, if they're you know 13, 14 years old, uh, there are um, apps that you can put on that phone that whatever they're texting, whatever they're sending, you'll get a copy of it. I will <laughs> warn you, you're going to find out all the things they're interested in. <laughs> And you're going to see things that you probably don't want to see. But if you want to protect your kid, they, they you can put those on your phone and they won't. And as long as you don't tell them about it, they won't know about it. But if you tell them about it, they'll just get rid of it. Kids are pretty smart. They're going to figure it out. But there are apps. And if you uh, you know talk to the, your cell phone provider, they can get you to those those um, those apps. So I'm going to go off of that on social media and you folks use it for um, in the departments. I've seen pictures saying, do you know where this guy is? And it's a great resource, but it also has to affect you guys personally as well. It, social media is on a on hundred. It's on 24 seven. How and especially you folks have been in law enforcement for a long time that social media didn't exist. 
how are you folks transitioning on when to use it professionally, when to use it personally, and how do you folks work with the community as we all see it? They like to record you. We, um, with our our Facebook, we whatever put anybody puts on, we just leave on. If there's negative comments or negative comments, um, we use it as a tool. We know that there's going to be some negative things that that come about that. Uh, in my personal life, I don't have, my son works for Facebook full time. I don't have a Facebook account. Um, I, I just don't need, I don't have the need for everybody to know everything that I'm doing. And if I need to know something with my, my nieces or nephew, I call them and ask them. Um, we, as law enforcement officers, uh, we get a pretty thick skin. I do a lot of reading, reading with the Stoic, uh, you know, philosopher, for, you know, Hey, people are going to say bad things. Is it true or is it not true? If it's not true, I don't spend one moment worrying about it. And uh, I think most of us here have kind of grown to understand that people see and interpret things a certain way. But when you break it, break things down and you explain to them how, you know, you went from this point to the end of it. You And if people are open minded, they understand the process that we have to go through. So it's just understanding that if you if if you're going to have it you're going to you're going to have to take the time and be patient and work people through whatever it is they they've got a concern about and at the, again at the end of the day just like a bad relationship sometimes you have to agree to disagree agreeably and move on and as far as how we take that uh, some of it's rather entertaining <laughs> very entertaining but one thing i noticed when things got tough nationally for law enforcement the last couple of years our support shot through the roof, um, not just on social media, but uh, on a side note, I mean, I'm as fat as I've ever been with people dropping off stuff to the police department. <laughs> just when things get tough, we have a ton of support and that's exactly how it is on social media. Um, almost to the point where people that are pro police start, you know, almost attacking those that are a little negative on it. And that could become an issue at times, but the bottom line is the support's there. You know, you just brush off all the other nonsense. It's no different than when we walk into a bar at two thirty in the morning. Um, we hear the same things, and now it's just in writing on Facebook. It's it's it is what it is, and it's as cliche as it is. It's sticks and stones, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it's the world we live in. I think people expect most police agencies to have a some sort of social media presence. Um, the sheriff's office has a Facebook page, and we don't post everything we do on there. Um, I don't know who here is uh, members of the Walworth County Scanner page. If you watch that, that's that's not even a majority of what happens in the community on a daily basis. If you listen to our radios and our calls for service, you'd, you'd be surprised at how much activity that we actually have in rural Walworth, Walworth County. Um, but what we post is, is things that we would put a press release out on, like a, a major crash or a major investigation. Um, I don't know if you just saw the, saw the post uh, in the last few weeks, the cooperativeness between uh, the town of Delvin, the city of Delvin, and Elkhorn and the sheriff's office. Um, there was a burglary at the Dam Road gun shop. And while that complaint was being investigated, um, Elkhorn PD was responding to a suspicious vehicle call. And we ended up making an arrest and recovering all those weapons. But, you know, things like that we'll put on our Facebook page. But we just don't have the resources to be putting everything that we do on there. And sometimes there's an expectation from our citizens that they want everything on there. We just don't have the personnel to, to do that. And when you do put a post on there, um, you have to have someone who's gonna monitor the comments. Unfortunately, I wish there was a way um, that we could turn comments off, but we can't. Um, and we, we have to monitor that because there are times people that comment some pretty, pretty nasty things on there. Um, pretty vul things that are vulgar, things that are just completely inappropriate, and we'll have to hide those comments because we don't we don't want those on our page. Um, but we do have some assistance. Uh, our county administrator hired a communications um, specialist in the county administrator's office, and we've been working um, with that person to increase our social media presence, not only at the sheriff's office but all county departments from you know, DPW to Health and Human Service, the Lakeland School, to everything that the county does. So um, more to come on that in the future. But as far as the sheriff is concerned, um, we just don't have the resources of putting everything that we do on our Facebook page. We try to keep the community 
uh, as informed as we can, but just know that one of the main reasons is because we just don't have the resources to, to, to do that. It, it, just to follow up, you know, I think he makes a, a, Dave makes a great point. We don't have the resources to put everything up, but if you go on to citizen services part of Pro Phoenix, you can look that stuff up in your community and they'll they'll give you the calls of service. Not going to give you the information, but you're going to know where the foot patrols are, if there's a burglary or if there you could you have access to that information if you if the department that serves you has that open and, and working for you. I know in the city of Delavan we do. So if you're looking for information, that's a place that you can go look look for. Uh, just I can tell you that if they post things with their uniform on or if they're making comments with their uniform on, that's a violation of our policy. They cannot do that. Uh, we've had people with, you know, colorful comments. Um, we, you know, they get, they have to make sure that they're separating their, their, their personal and professional life. We don't want them representing the, the department when they're talking about their political beliefs, their spiritual beliefs, or anything like that. And I think for the most part, especially in the last few years, people have really gotten attuned to that. Like I said, listen, I, I've got my son works for Facebook. Uh, I have a Facebook account, but all I do is put my pictures on it. I have zero friends. Literally, I have zero friends. So I, but I, I don't, I, th I think it's a, I think social media is a wonderful, wonderful tool. Okay. If it's used and managed properly, but the problem is, is that we give these tools to young people or we give these tools to people that, that will, would say something anonymously or at a distance that would not say it to somebody's face. I wouldn't put, post anything that I wouldn't say to you, to your face. I, if, if I think that's a very good rule, if you're, if you're not willing to tell somebody that they, they think that they're ignorant and that their part, you know, their, their thoughts are wrong for X, Y, and Z on, online, you better be able to say that in person. I think it's just, I think that it, it allows cowards to, to try to, to make things that, you know, more than what they are. We're all entitled to our opinions. We're not entitled to our own facts. And I think that it just gets down to, you know, being respectful, kind, and compassionate to one another. And, you know, like I said, that's our vision, but that's the way I want our people to live. And I want, I raise my kids that way. My wife and I behave that way. We just don't do things that are hurtful to other people. If we have something that we need to talk to somebody about that that's important or private, that's what we do. We go talk to them. We, you know, it's, that's not a, that's not a, for the world to see or the rest of the family to see or anything like that. Social media is, is, is not the appropriate spot to be. Now I do have a little bit of a thing with Snapchat. I love catching people doing dumb things and sending it, but that's me. I'm a little quirky that way. I like to have fun that way, but it's in good nature. I don't do things that are embarrassing. But the point of the you know, we always want to come together as a community. We always want to be <laughs> supportive of each other. But when you're sitting on this side and you have, you know, somebody who is at your child's school uh, preaching, 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 but then they see that in a public forum. 
Facebook or social apps. Yeah. Completely going against what they just said. So it's, it's hard to keep that connection and trust. Absolutely. And I think that Listen. a lot that doesn't happen in Northern County as far as that. And I, as a mom and as a wife and a worker of Northern County, I would like to see more. Every every relationship is built on trust, whether it's this this conversation that we're having, our new relationship, relationship on, on, on social media, people. We've got, and, and the only way that we maintain trust is that we're respectful to one another. It really it aggravates me as, as a human being that when you see people treating people like they're not valued, we all want to be valued. And that's the biggest damn near everything that we deal with in our professional lives is because people aren't valuing somebody else. There, there's nothing I hate worse than a friggin' bully. All right. And that's what you see on social media. And, you know, what used to happen when we were kids and the big kid would, do, you know, pick on somebody or they feel like they had, you know, uh, influence over somebody, they would, they would take advantage of that. Well, anybody can do that now. And that's the, that's the, that's the drawback. It's just, we got to, we as adults, we as parents, we as leaders in our community, if we're not modeling that we respect and value you, then listen, it's, it, listen, it's, it's over. And that's why, you know, when I talk to my officers about going through the schools and, you know, going into businesses and walking neighborhoods, I want them to have that connection. And I want them be not just to have the connection, but I want them to, you know, let people know we value you. You know, I, I don't know how many times I walk through Fleet Farm and everybody says, oh, thank you for what you do. And I'm thinking, hey, thanks for paying taxes. Otherwise, I don't get to do what I do. Right. <laughs> so we've both we're both showing value to one another. And I think that it's so important. It kind of gets back with everything that we've talked about is are we valuing one another? And that's where that's where the social breakdown between husband and wife, father and son, country and country. It's, you know, what we see in our political. Listen, we're just not valuing each other. And listen, I have fr I'm a conservative guy and I got friends that are very liberal. And, you know, this last <clears throat> couple of years, things went off the rail. I said, wait a second. I said, do you realize that it's the 5% on each gen that we aren't going to agree on? It's 90% in the middle that we agree on. We're, you're going you're gonna to get mad and throw away a 30-year relationship over the stuff that we're not going to agree on. Agree, 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 disagree agreeably, right? And after we sat there and for a few minutes, the, my buddy sat down. He goes, you know what? You're right. We're not going to do that. But you got to stay calm and you got to understand that people's emotions are going to get the best of them from time to time. And that's why that's that's what police do. We just manage people's emotions. We get there. We calm things down. We try to we try to, you know, bring, uh, you know, calm back to the situation and get normalcy back so people can start to communicate again. Because when we get there, nobody's listening. Nobody's communicating. You know, we, you know, one of the old tricks that I like to do when I go, when we, I used to work the road and we get to a domestic and everybody's screaming, say, stop. And we go, we teach them the old Indian talking stick. I don't know if you ever heard of that, but only the person that has the stick can talk. And we used to sit down. I mean, it, right. I mean, these guys will tell you going to a domestic, it sometimes takes an hour to get people calmed down. And, so, and when sometimes you have to do things, you know, goofy things like that to get people's attention. So they start to talk to you. And they start to listen to each other because at the end of the night, I'm going home to my wife. My wife loves me. We're going to watch a movie together. We're going to have supper. It's great. But these people are going to have to start repairing their relationship. And that's really what we're trying to do, trying to get people to repair that relationship. So we're not back there. So their success, they know their families are successful and their kids start to feel valued. Because when you go to these homes where parents are going, not having a good time, the kids are not, they're, they're, they're having problems at school. They're not having, you know, grades at school, discipline at school, discipline out in the community. If we can get parents to respect one another and show that respect and value to their kids, all of a sudden we're working ourselves out of a job. 
I don't think that's going to happen, but that's what it is. But I know it's kind of a long answer when it comes to social media, but it's just we got to value each other in, in whether it's over social media or person in person. Anybody else would like to share on the panel? There's anything more I can add. <laughs> well, I mean, you took 34 minutes. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm not well, we do have a question um, online. Mary Ellen wrote, is there a place in the home, fridge, bulletin board, et cetera, where a person could put vital information, med list, DNR papers, so that if police or first responders come to the home, they will are instructed to look and get info on the resident who may be unconscious or not able to communicate? Yeah, I think the fire departments have a program um, where you put it on the refrigerator and that's kind of the place that they would focus on. And I, that would, you know, someplace that's, you know, um, in an obvious location where we can, we can see it, especially if someone lives alone and they want us to know the information. This may be a really silly question, but when you folks go to a call, when is the fire department alongside of you? Cause I know sometimes you team play it. I, I'm not really sure. Oh, let me take this. <laughs> I'm going to turn my Have microphone off because Chief's got this one. If you ever notice when, they, when they, the fire department gets there that everybody's out of the house, you know why? Because the police have been there to get everybody out first. <laughs> I have a great relationship with our fire department because every time that I see that the house is burned to the ground, I always send them a thank you note for saving the basement. Love my fire department. But no, we listen, we, the, the departments, you know, the fire department, police department, there's, well, we're better than they are. But anyway, we, we do have a good relationship. Listen, we, we work in tandem. Nobody get, you know, when we get there, we, we try to get people out especially like apartment buildings. And then we get out there, we direct traffic and let them do their job. Yeah. They're, you know, all the fire departments in our County are just super people. They, they're giving back to their community. They're, they're service minded. They're wonderful people. And yeah, we work together. And then if, if it's a suspicious fire, uh, generally, I, I don't know about other departments, but we will take on the, the, well, the arson task force could be there, but we'll have a, a detective right along with them and we'll investigate that with them. And I'll just kind of add on to what the chief said. Um, we we get to work with all the fire departments in the county, being, being the sheriff's office, because we work in the entire county. And I, I have to agree, we have excellent fire services in our county, excellent EMS services and rescue squads. And we have to understand that most of these people are volunteers, and they're volunteering their time to work in these capacities, getting called out all hours of the day and night. And they have full-time jobs and full-time commitments, but yet they volunteer. And I think the fire departments um, are having a, the same kind of um, troubles that we're having in recruiting people to come work for them. So if anybody out there listening um, wants to volunteer in your community, consider your fire EMS departments in the county. Um, they're well-trained and we're looking forward to the interoperability between uh, law enforcement and the fire service when it comes to uh, enhancing our communications and our records management systems moving forward. But um, the question that you asked is how, you know, how do we respond with the fire departments? And I'll just give you uh, an example of, of a car crash. We, we at the sheriff's department deal with a lot of high-speed crashes in the county and, and deal with a lot of traffic crashes. And we get to work with a lot of the fire departments and it's it's the cooperativeness, it's it's the knowing the members of, the, of each department um, and being able to establish what's called unified command quickly. Um, so wh whoever is our deputies on the scene, someone needs to take control, um, meet with the fire department and find out what their resources are, what they need from us, what we need to from them and, and work uh, co and cooperatively with them because they have a job to do, put out the fire, make the, make the scene safe, those types of things. Our job is to investigate. So we need to work together. Um, and I think in this county, we, we really do a good job of working um, together with our with our fire departments, and I, I, I know that the, the chief kind of had some jokingness about you know police and fire, and you're always going to have that. But at the end of the day, um, we're all brothers and sisters. Work together uh, cooperatively. So.
If nobody else would like to say we can end things. Um, yes, Chief. Um, Delavan has a, a homeless uh, homelessness and poverty task force that, that, that they're, they got, got started a year ago. I know county's got um, a, a, a group of people there together, but I put some numbers together in um, Walworth County uh, over the last couple of weeks. We have... Um, Oh gosh, now I, I, I got to think now. 177 students that are homeless in Walworth County, and we have uh, uh, and we had 100 and 127, I believe, homeless transient men that we deal with on a regular basis in Walworth County. So. We're talking, you know, well over 200, almost 300 people that are homeless. And so that's a big thing that we're going to start really working on to try to match up people with the resources. I found that we have a lot of resources. We do. And, um, I, and, and a lot of those, I don't know that we're all talking and, and organizing. Right? So that's what we're in a process. Of. But there's another initiative that, you know, it's not really police work, but we're trying to help people and get them to the right places. So. Just wanted to touch on that real quick, and I know you want to get going. So, <laughs> no, I I like that you're sharing this information because I think us as a community member, if you're not engaged in it all the time, you do not know what is out there or what is available to use or to give back. I think that is very important and to understand both sides of it. So I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to thank everyone that was in attendance tonight, both in person and online. I would like to especially thank our panelists for sharing their insight and expertise. As you have heard tonight, our agencies are community responsive and transparent. As our culture changes, our police agencies have changed alongside it. We all know change is not easy, but we do have to work together to make our community stronger and resilient. Thank you again for your engagement. We look forward to seeing you next month talking about embracing diversity in the community and stay healthy and stay resilient. Thank you.